Thank you, Kevin. And our uh, second speaker in this session uh, comes from the organization that I think uh, is uh, associated with big data brand, because if you go and search for big data and science, you immediately stumble um, upon all of the uh, challenges that NSF has put out. So we're very happy to have uh, Suzanne Yacona from NSF. And um, I think it takes a person with a uh, degree in social ecology to really drive this uh, process. Uh, so thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really um, a great pleasure to uh, be here today. Um, I want to commend you all for taking the time to deal with the incredible challenges um, that you've brought uh, together in this uh, particular conference. I think that the challenges are absolutely critical to the good of the nation. Um, I know you recognize that they're all hard. Um, and so I agree with that tenured professor over there who said, you have to self-organize, right? Because there's no other way to go forward but to do what you're doing, talk to each other, and figure out a plan for how to go forward. Okay. Um, so big data is in the air. As John Holdren, uh, the head of OSTP, uh, said, big data is a big deal. Um, and so, you know, just coming over here in the taxi, I probably got, you know, 100 emails giving me big data solutions, right, for, uh, you know, how I can go forward in my organization. So everybody's trying to make money off of big data. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things. First, where did the data come from and why we have a national initiative today? Okay, so um, I think historically we understand that big data comes from big science. At the National Science Foundation, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars every single year on very large-scale instruments. And these large-scale instruments are good for collecting lots of data. So our astronomers uh, depend on huge telescopes that are all over the globe. Uh, we are continuously developing uh, new approaches to taking pictures of the sky. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for example, uh, has given us more information than we had ever had before. Uh, there are new telescopes that are proposed, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, with 3.3 gigapixel digital cameras. Right? So we will be able to get so many pictures of the sky in so many different ways, under so many different conditions, we will have so much data about the sky um, that the astronomers uh, will have enough you know, information to, to do lots of good science. OK, so big data, um, big science really talks about the volume. Um, but this group probably knows there's another source of big data uh, today. And that is all of the sensors that we have put into our natural and built environments. The Indian Ocean has sensors all over the bottom of it. There are sensors in our roads, sensors in our bridges, sensors in our buildings. Why? Well, because scientists would like to know what is going on in the Indian Ocean when they're not in a boat themselves out there collecting data, but back at their desk, you know, looking at the data, right? So having these sensors enables us to collect data under conditions when often humans can't be there. What happens to animals in the forest when there is a fire? Well, we can have sensors, we can build sensors today that can withstand that kind of heat. We can collect those kinds of data. And so having sensors in places like bridges helps us to actually collect the data, reason about it, and make on-the-fly decisions. We can stop people from going over a bridge if that bridge is about to fall down. Right? So it's not just about data analysis over tens 20, 30 years, but it's actually being able to do things in real time that could possibly save lives. Okay, and then the third, uh, 
place where we're getting tons of data, right? Count the number of devices that you have on you, you know, in your purse and your briefcase. Um, we have an explosion, right, of communications devices. How many people remember this kind of phone? There's a few of us still in the room, right? Still standing that this was, you know, analog communications, right? The only way that we would have a trace of what was said was if the FBI were listening in on you, right? And doing, a, you know, an, an audio taping what you were saying. But today, we have traces of all of our communications, all of our emails. Um, and it's not just text. Um, so uh, internet traffic, uh, the 60% is video and music sharing. Right, and so this kind of unstructured communication, not necessarily in databases, certainly not uh, relational databases, uh, with no metadata, right, is available for us to analyze and to triangulate what were people talking about at the at the time of certain events. You know, what were people talking about while we were having an election? What are people talking about? when we have earthquakes and other events around the, around the globe. Okay, and then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the long tail of science. So there are uh, huge communities uh, in physics, astronomy, right, where uh, those, those uh, science communities have organized themselves over the years, and they really do share large amounts of data. But that's not really typical. If we look across the universities and colleges in this country, you have individuals with their students, maybe small teams, developing their own little database with their own way of understanding, their own format, their own approach. Can they share that with their neighbor down the hallway? Um, probably not. Can they share it within their community? Probably not. Why? Because it's this highly customized, highly individualistic data archive that someone set up in their own particular way. Um, however, if we could figure out how to make heterogeneous data seem more homogeneous, we could use those, those data that are strewn around and are everywhere. Um, perhaps really critical data that people have, and we don't even know how critical it is today. So it's really important that we not just consider the big data, the big archives, but think about the small archives and how we could bring them together into something that could be big. Okay, how big is big? So we're throwing around this word. So I have to tell you, so um, I co-chair the Big Data Senior Steering Group, and Alan Drury is a, a member of that group, which is why I think I'm here today. Um, and so a lot of people would come and say, well, I don't think my data set is really big enough to really be considered big. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm not allowed to be in this Big Data Senior Steering Group. And so what we decided was that there, it's really relative. It's relative to the community in which you exist. And so we've kind of fashioned, you know, our definition after this McKinsey report that says if you are, you know, working with data and the current tools and approaches that, you, that you're using to answer your research questions are no longer working for you, then you've hit up against the big data wall, right? And so depending on which community you're in, you're going to hit upon it today, tomorrow, but you're going to hit upon it really soon. Um, so that allows us to have a big tent. Everybody can come in. Everybody can talk about these issues because if you've not hit the big data wall, you will soon. Okay, and so it's not just volumes of data. So I don't know if anyone gave a talk at the beginning about the three Vs or the four Vs. I hate that, just, just for the record. Um, it's so reductionist, and it really, you know, I know it's clever, but um, it really doesn't hit upon the really, the, the serious challenges um, that we face with data. 
And it's this heterogeneity um, of the data is really one of the, the key things. And it's everything that I heard this morning, levels of granularity, which format are you keeping it? Is it text? Is it picture? You know, how do you timestamp it, right? My discipline likes to, to, to save things one way, and you like to do it another way. The data are incomplete, right? They're, the representation types vary. And we're always dealing with some level of uncertainty with the data. So I think that this, it's much more complex than, than some of the pundits would like to make it seem. And I think it's much harder. And I think that's why you folks are talking about what should we do next. OK, so why is big data important? Uh, and again, I'm talking from the, the US government perspective in general. I'm at NSF, but um, you know, I co-chair this interagency group. And I think that, um, that everyone believes that there is this opportunity today uh, because we can capture the data. We have figured out uh, a lot of the things that the, the person from USGS, Kevin, I believe, was saying before. We have figured out how to share it. We have figured out how to analyze it. So there is this really critical uh, time where we could actually do a lot more in terms of new discoveries than we have done in the past. Um, every day in the newspaper, I read about some organization that's using big data within their organization to be more productive, uh, to, to ha gain more profit, right? All the big box stores are figuring out where they're going to put things, you know, because they understand if people just rush in, guys rush in, you have to have all the guy stuff at the front of the store. You can put the women stuff at the back because they will walk through the store. Um, and so there's, this is a science to all of this, right? And, and you better believe that our commercial firms are taking advantage of this. And then finally, um, we have so many pressing challenges. And this particular group, you know, focusing on the relationship between environment and health, it is so critically important. And there are many other challenges in terms of the science of learning. Right? How can we learn more about how we, how we as humans learn things? Um, transportation, energy, I mean the list goes on and on. Um, and so we believe that with big data we can really try to uh, make, uh, take some big steps there. Okay, so, um, so the reason some of the, these pictures are missing is because I wasn't able to get permission and this is being posted and, and webcast. Um, but I believe that there is right now um, something that we're talking about which is a paradigm shift from hypothesis driven to data driven discovery. Okay, so when I was in school, which was a very, very long time ago, I took lots of statistics classes. And what was the focus in those statistics classes? Small data sets. How, much, how many data points, you know, what's the minimum you can have to say something with what confidence level, right? And so it was all about how can I sample? How can I get the right sample size, right? And it was all of this worry about I have to collect data in this little teeny tiny data sets that, that we worked with. Like, for example, a classroom or comparing two classrooms in a school. And now we can have, you know, MOOCs, right? These massive open online courses with 200,000 people online clicking, right? And you can have their entire click stream. You can have their communications, their chat logs, where they went, what they read, right? So we're talking a different era in terms of the kinds of statistics, the kinds of mathematics that we bring to our scientific problems, right? And so I get into trouble every time I talk about this at NSF because there's a lot of people uh, my age uh, who work there um, who say, oh my God, you're just, you're getting rid of the scientific method, Susie. You're saying that you can pre-digest data and then from that you can make hypotheses. But, you know, so do you know this urban myth or it's a, a kind of urban myth whereby uh, some big box store, you know, figured out that if you put beer next to diapers, you sell more beer. Everybody knows this story, right? So this is not the kind of hypothesis 
that most people, uh, you, you guys are smart, maybe you would figure it out uh, on your own, but just sitting at your desk by yourself. But when you're looking through data and you're starting to look for anomalies, looking for patterns, when you have complete data about all the stores across the country, sales of diapers, sales of beer, and you can start to see, aha, when you put them together, we're selling more. And from there, you can start to develop new hypotheses. So it's a kind of new starting point, a new entry point for how we think about the future. Now, someone, and I think it was you, Ivan, who brought this up, but how do we reason about this? How do we make sure that we're making the right assumptions? How do we you know, not assume some kind of causal inference that isn't there? And I think that this is a real challenging um, uh, issue for big data. As we make these leaps, as we pre-digest, as we present things to the world, and I think it's an education issue because you have to have people in the loop. It is not just about machines, you know, doing the number crunching and then the very smart people taking that out and figuring out what's going on. It's really thinking about the whole process and how that process was set up and what the implications might be and what the potential array of hypotheses might be about why you found what you found. And I think, you know, going back to my statistics classes, you know, that we have to, you know, across the U.S., we have got to educate our young people to understand this kind of new era of statistics and mathematics and how you can make scientific inference. Okay, so, um, so we believe that you can really move from data to knowledge to action. If we could accomplish all of the great things that, that we would like to accomplish, um, you know, really automatic extraction of new knowledge, but again, within the context of communities and people reasoning about what that means uh, through data mining, machine learning, visualization, and all the kinds of tools that you've been talking about. So I'd like to give this example of disaster informatics because I, it gives this flavor of how kind of real-time, um, you know, number crunching can really make a difference. But you could imagine you know, having images of the actual, whatever the, de the disaster is, 3D toxic fume images. I can imagine having models and simulations of, you know, given the wind, you know, where uh, those, uh, those fumes are going to spread. You know, integrated with actual data about where people are located on the ground. Um, and then giving this to first responders so that they can figure out evacuation routes so that people will actually go down the right roads to, to get out of harm's way, right? And not down the wrong roads where they might go into harm's way. If we can do this in real time, we will have accomplished something great. And it is an example of data to knowledge, to action. And just to kind of drill down uh, even deeper, uh, Amy McGovern at um, Oklahoma University you know, is really looking at all of the different kinds of variables that are necessary to understand storms and the path of storms. So again, this is exploding the kinds of data that we might have available to us, the updraft, the downdraft, the vorticity, the spins, right? So that you can begin to figure out where, the, where that storm is going. And if you've got tornadoes and you've got um, really big storms that are going to knock down buildings and, and hurt people, it's really would be nice to know what that direction is. Okay, many research challenges. I think that you've covered them all here for the past day and a half. I'm not going to go over them um, again. Um, so I want to get back to why we have this um, uh, this initiative, this national initiative now. And so uh, in 2010, there was a report done by the President Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Um, they were reviewing the, the Networking Information Technology R&D program, which is an interagency program across all of the agencies in the government that invest in IT R&D. And they observed that we were under-investing in big data and in all of the, the science of big data. And so this report really pushed us to do more. Um, 
the Office of Science and Technology Policy then took this up, uh, this challenge, and chartered in the spring of 2011 um, a big data senior steering group. Um, there are members from many of the federal agencies. Uh, it's co-chaired by NSF and uh, my former co-chair, Karen Remington from NIH, uh, served with me um, at the beginning. We're still looking for a co-chair, so if there's any volunteers in the room, uh, please let me know. Uh, but the initial charge back in 2011 was, what's the national strategy? What's the plan? How are we going to go forward? Understanding that the opportunities are great and the challenges are just as, just as great. So how are we going to go forward? Okay, so I'm giving you these lists of the big data membership just to impress you um, because we started out with a very small group um, and very shortly we have now about 20 agencies participating in this group. Uh, we were able to get our act together sufficiently to have a big data launch um, in March, um, <clears throat> almost a year now ago. Um, we uh, had this at AAAS here in DC. Uh, there were a number of announcements. Uh, John Holdren kind of uh, led off the meeting. Then we had announcements from a number of agencies, um, six agencies saying what it was they were going to do with new money um, over the next few years in the area of big data. Uh, this number, 200 million, was bandied uh, about in terms of, of what would be spent. Um, Steve Lohr from the New York Times had just uh, done a, an article on big data, so we asked him if he wouldn't come down and moderate a, a, a panel, and he did. He wrote an article that morning kind of talking about the U.S. government and big data. Um, but this was just the kickoff, right? So this is not the end point, this is the beginning of what we're doing. And so this is the strategy. Uh, this is the plan uh, that we were told to go forward and figure out. Um, and so the, the first area that we are to deal with is foundational research, which is new techniques, new technologies um, uh, to derive knowledge from data. So what I'm talking about here is algorithms. I'm talking about visualization tools. I'm talking about using new types of statistics. I'm talking about bringing mathematicians, statisticians together with computer scientists to do the kinds of basic research, scalable algorithms, new tools, all of that, that we're going to need not today. So I know you're all talking a lot about your struggles today. But you're going to be struggling even more five, ten years down the road than you are today, if you can believe that. And so what we have to do is we have to think about, okay, where are we going? What are the frontiers? And we've got to get our scientists, our engineers out there thinking about the future, right? And the kinds of things that you might be coming up against in the future. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the cyber infrastructure that has to be developed and coming up with new frameworks for how we're going to do that. Number three, education and workforce development. Uh, McKinsey report uh, predicts a shortfall of something like, I think, 190,000 data scientists over the next five to 10 years. And then something like another million managers who understand the importance of data science to their organization. Even though they're not practitioners themselves, we need to have uh, managers we need to have a citizenry for that fact that kind of understands what this means. And then finally, we are trying to do things that are um, out of the box thinking. So we're doing competitions, prizes, trying to incentivize people uh, to, to come up with solutions in new ways. Okay, so this is the big data uh, solicitation joint between NSF and NIH um, that was put out last year. Um, again, I was, I'm talking about core uh, computer science combined with mathematics and statistics. Um, we have made eight awards out of the mid-scale range from that solicitation. We'll be making a whole bunch more awards soon. Um, but they cover the three main areas, which are collection, storage, and management of big data, data analytics, which is absolutely critical because if we're going to move from data 
to knowledge to action. We have to be able to extract it and analyze it in ways that are very smart. And then finally, the third area is data sharing and collaboration over distances, right? Our scientists are not co-located. What are the platforms that we need? OK, I am not going to read these citations, um, but I knew that there would be a lot of academics sitting here. And I wanted you to see that your organization is probably up here in this list of people who have received awards already. So data collection and management, right? So University of Washington, SUNY, Stony Brook, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Harvard, right? Brown University, data analytics, Carnegie Mellon, Iowa State, um, Cornell, right? And so we're going to be making a lot more awards uh, in, a sm in a smaller size class coming up here very soon. But we're really getting, if you will, the the academics out there thinking about big data challenges so as to help all of us. OK, I just want to talk very briefly about uh, contests and uh, competitions. So at NSF, you know, we give grants, right? Best effort. Uh, we give you the money. You sign the line. And you go off and you do whatever uh, it is that you can do, you know, given the, the proposal. Um, but it's best effort. We really don't punish you if you don't make that breakthrough discovery. Competitions are different. You send people off to do the work before, and if they come up with a solution you like, then you give them the money and they go away, right? So it's a different kind of thing. But we're trying to play with this because NASA has had great success, uh, and other agencies too. I just know more about NASA. In all kinds of areas of using competitions to solve, some of their problems that their bench scientists have not been able to solve for some number of years. Uh, so NSF, NASA, DOE Office of Science uh, put out a contest, actually a series of contests, with the question of how do you make heterogeneous data seem more homogeneous? And so we had an ideation contest in general, just open to all areas of science. We had one that focused on energy, and the third one that focused on Earth sciences. Um, we have a number of uh, esteemed judges. We had particular criteria that they had to use. We used TopCoder. Um, they have a platform for this kind of thing to reach out to the open source uh, community. Uh, and so we're going to be ma making some announcements about uh, the winners of this particular set of challenges. And then we're going to go forward with actually uh, development, real code, running code, uh, with people giving us back the code um, if they actually win. And, and very small amounts of money, $100 was, I mean, you're laughing, but I mean, it's tiny amounts of money. But at TopCoder, these, these software developers, they have to have a score, right? So when you go get a job as a software developer, they ask you, what's your TopCoder score, right? And so you have to enter these contests all the time in order to get your score higher so that you can get hired. OK, I'm almost at the end here. Um, so we also, I, I mentioned education and workforce. So we have a program at NSF, IGERT, Integrative Graduate Education Research Traineeship. Um, and so we had a special track focused on big data, about 80 um, uh, applications to this. Uh, and we're about set to announce the winners. And so if some of you may know about at your university, you know IGERTs are limited. You know, each university can only submit so many of them. Um, Another great opportunity, our education directorate is very interested in using MOOCs and other kinds of large-scale data sets to figure out the science of learning. Right? So they're going to be doing some ideas labs, um, really focused on you know, jump-starting um, the science of learning. OK, EarthCube is uh, a cyber infrastructure um, project uh, program um, at NSF. So if you know anything about our geosciences directorate, there's three divisions. There's one division that focuses on the Earth. There is a second division that focuses on water and the oceans. And the third one focuses on the atmosphere. So you can bet that the data archives that have grown up in those divisions are focused on, right, they're siloed, right? There's the Earth folks, there's the water folks, and there's the atmosphere people. 
well, wouldn't it be great if they could share data across those databases, across those areas of science, and really think about research questions that were the whole gamut of uh, climate change, right, where you have to consider all of those variables. And so uh, Tim Colleen from NCAR was the head of the, the Geoscience Directorate. He came up with this incredible idea of what if we could get the community together um, and get them thinking about, again, how they're going to self-organize to kind of figure out how they're going to better share data across the years and come up with a, a geoscience data infrastructure that can be fully shared by everyone. Uh, so we're very excited by this, this program, uh, hoping that other directorates will, will uh, take this lead and kind of figure out, self-organize, and start building the, the, the data infrastructure that they need. Um, so policy, of course, is absolutely critical. We've talked a lot about um, um, data sharing, you know, what are the rules, what is the governance, you know, when do we publish, when do we, you know, who do we let see what, when, how do we replicate our science if we're not sharing. And so there's a lot of uh, discussions around um, policy issues. Those are not happening particularly in the big data senior steering group because there are a, a number of other groups that have really taken on policy issues. Having said that, we understand that it kind of infiltrates everything that we're thinking about, everything that we're trying to do. And data privacy is uh, absolutely critical today. Um, at NSF, we actually have a number of programs that are trying to figure out, you know, how you can include privacy in new technologies. That is, design the technology understanding that privacy is going to be an issue down the road, rather than tacking that on afterwards. You've designed the technology, now people are, oh, woe is me, my, you know, my privacy is gone, right? Let's think about what our human values are, what we want, and design technologies um, in this way. Okay, so the opportunities for the future are great. Um, U.S. government is investing and will continue to invest in this area over the coming years if only we could get out of a continuing resolution. Um, we would be just fine. <laughs> um, and so hopefully we'll get a budget this fiscal year um, and in future years because we really have a great plan, I think, and we're really going gangbusters across all of the agencies that are part of this. Thank you. <laughs>